Open your Bibles with me to Romans chapter 8. Once again, Romans chapter 8. I guess I should open there too. Well, we are finally in the month of December. As you can see, Christmas time is here. How many of you go-getters are already finished with your Christmas shopping? Anybody? Okay, we got a few. Again, this side of the room. I don't, okay, we got a few over here this time. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I always now try to get as much of my shopping done for Christmas as I can at Black Friday, Cyber Monday now with all those deals. Although we do have to be careful right now with having a two- and a four-year-old with putting their wrapped presents under the Christmas tree too early. How many of y'all grown up, your your presents would sit under the tree and in anticipation you would see them, okay? Not many. How many of you, 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 your parents didn't put out, sorry, Santa, (coughs) uh, kids in the room, kids' church. Uh, How many of y'all's parents didn't put out the presents until right before, like on Christmas Eve? Okay, man, a lot of y'all. I feel like, is that what you guys said you guys would do? Yeah, so we would have the presents out, you know, for like a month or so. I guess I'm learning a lot of people don't do that. We would have the presents out for like, like I mean, like a, a good month in advance. Pretty much the whole month of December, we would just see more and more presents just stacking up under the tree. And um, look, part of the reason I don't trust my kids to do that right now is because I remember myself at that age, and how I hated just waiting, having to wait for Christmas to open my presents. I mean, they were already purchased, right? They were sitting on the tree. It's not like it'd be stealing, technically, right? Like, like taking that she gets it. You know, it's not going to be stealing, getting them a little bit early. They're already paid for. So why do we have to wait for the torture of waiting for Christmas Day? Remember, I used to pick them up and, and shake them. Used to feel, put my fingers on, on the lining of the, 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 the wrapping to figure out what, what shape of the box maybe this was. And man, we would do everything I can to figure out what the present was. I was not patient when it came to waiting for my Christmas presents. Well, likewise, I found that many Christians struggle with patience when it comes to waiting for the ultimate present of Christmas, our future inheritance from God, our Father. If you remember, if you were here last week with us, which by the way, I'll do my best to catch you up, but, but you're going to miss out a little bit from, if you haven't heard, you can always go back, by the way, on our YouTube to catch up with those last two messages from Romans 8. But we talked in Romans 8 from last week that as Christians, we are heirs of God. Look at Romans 8, verse 14 again. This was from last week. It says, For those who are led by the Spirit of God, which, as we read in the text, is all Christians, for those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. Then look at verse 17. Now if we are children, then we are heirs. Heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. What an incredible statement. We are heirs of God. What this means is that everything that belongs to God, all of the glory, all of the riches of both heaven and earth, will one day we will inherit as God's children. It's incredible. And then he says the second statement that we are co-heirs with Christ, with Jesus. All this means is that as Jesus inherits all things from God the Father by nature of him being God the Son, then we too share in this inheritance by our nature as Christians of being in Christ. It says in Hebrews 1 verse 2, But in these last days, God has spoken to us by his son, that's Jesus. And then it says this, whom he appointed heir of all things. Jesus said it himself in John 17, verse 10. Jesus prayed to God the Father and he said, all I have is yours and all you have is mine. And glory has come to me through them. 
What this means is that when we place our faith in Jesus and we're saved, that we become in Christ. That phrase is found all throughout the New Testament. Paul uses it many times. We're in Christ. And that means so many things, but what it means here is we become heirs with Jesus of all things. Y'all following me on that? God owns all things. Jesus is God the Son. He's the heir. When we're in Christ, everything that's Jesus's is now ours. This is a remarkable truth. We who were once slaves to sin and set to inherit eternal death and damnation, because of God's mercy, we will not only be spared eternal punishment from God, but gifted with eternal possessions from God. All the riches of heaven with its streets of gold, eternal life and peace, living as sons and daughters of the king of kings together with him in his glorious kingdom. This is our future inheritance as believers. <coughs> However, the challenge before us currently is in that weighty term, in that last sentence, future. Though we are heirs to God himself, the sovereign ruler of the universe, our inheritance remains in the realm of what is yet to come. What this means for us right now is that we must wait for it. We must be patient. Much like a child eagerly awaiting his Gifts at Christmas morning, we're not always good at the waiting game. But our passage this morning points out that waiting is a significant part of the Christian life. That patience is crucial as we navigate the present while looking forward to the future treasures that make up our inheritance. So notice with me this morning from our text three treasures of our future inheritance for which right now we must be patient. We must be patient, number one, for our revealing as God's children. We must be patient for our revealing as God's children. What are you talking about, Pastor Matt? Well, look in verse 17. He says, now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs with God and co-heirs with Christ. But notice the next phrase. If indeed we share in his, what's the next word? Sufferings. Sufferings. In order that we may also share in his glory. Now wait just a minute. Suffering? Like Pastor Matt, I, I thought you said this was going to be an encouraging chapter in the Bible. I thought you said this was like the summit. This is, this is, this is the chapter of victory. Like suffering, that's, that's a bad word. Like suffering means pain. It means anguish, misery. You said, Pastor Matt, I thought being a Christian... We, we read in, in, in Romans 8, 1 that we are no longer condemned. I thought it meant no longer being a slave, but now we're sons of God. And so what's all this about suffering? Well, all those things are true. We are no longer condemned, meaning that we will not suffer God's wrath and, f and for eternity be in separation from him in hell. On judgment day, it will be declared of us not guilty because Christ has clothed us in his own righteousness and one day we will dine with him at his very table in his kingdom. However, as we talked about last week, all that's in the future. All that will be in our glorification where we will be free from sin's very presence. 
But look back at verse 17 again. He said, if indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share with him in his glory. So we will one day share in the glory of Jesus, but only if, if right now we share in Jesus' suffering. So just as for Jesus, glory came only after suffering, so glory with Christ for the Christian only comes first after suffering. Much like Jesus experienced suffering, persecution, temptation during his time on earth, we followers of Christ should expect nothing less in this life. Just as Jesus had to die before he was resurrected in his glorified body, we too must die to ourselves before we can earn, before we can enjoy our eternal resurrected body. By the way, this isn't a way to, to earn our salvation. This isn't uh, some, some sort of painful penance that we must do that finally, that we somehow merit God's favor and earn our eternal life. No, no, remember we talked about this is, this is by grace. This is only, this is a pure gift from God that we receive only through faith by believing in Jesus' sacrifice for us. So what is this? Well, rather, this part, this suffering, this is part of God's plan of salvation for our good. You see, to suffer is part of the sanctification process that we talked about, <coughs> that we talked about last week, whereby Jesus painfully but lovingly chisels away at our weakness, at our flaws, at our self-interest, at our sin, conforming us each and every single day into his image in preparation for our glorification. Romans 5.3 says it this way. He said earlier in the book, he said, we also glory, think about these terms, we glory in our sufferings. He says, because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. He's saying that the suffering makes, gives us this, an endurance, and, and it builds us up, and that, that endurance in life to face the, the troubles of this life, it actually creates in us, he uses the word hope, and that's the same word we're going to see in our text here in a minute. The idea, it, it, it's helping us remain faithful, remain steadfast in our faith as we look forward to our glorification. Paul wrote it this way in 2 Corinthians 4.16. He says, therefore we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly, we are being renewed day by day. That's that sanctification process. He says, for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. 1 Peter 4.12, Peter put it this way. He said, dear friends, he said, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on to test you. As though something strange were happening to you, but rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. Scripture is clear. If we follow Jesus, then like Jesus, we will suffer and die. We may not all suffer physically. We may not all die physically 
from following Jesus, but nevertheless, we will suffer. We will die to our own desires. If we truly are following Jesus and, and following his words and obeying his words, hey, we're gonna die to our own uh, um, ambitions. We're gonna die to our own wants and to our own comfort. Just as Jesus did. Unlike uh, many Many a popular TV preacher today, following Jesus is not the secret to health, wealth, and happiness in this life, but the next life. This is because the process of sanctification necessarily entails suffering. But he says that if we share in Jesus' suffering, we also will share in his glory. Look again at verse 18. He said, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. If you know the person who wrote this, the Apostle Paul, and you know the sufferings that he went through for Christ, there's some weight to these words. He says that all the things we could suffer now for following Jesus, it's nothing. Uh, the worst we could possibly, the worst suffering, the worst loss we could possibly imagine, it's not even in the same league. You can't compare with what we will inherit in the next life. But then notice something else. Notice in verse 18, he uses the phrase, with the glory that will be revealed, what's the next two words? In us. The glory revealed in us. He doesn't say that this glory will be revealed to us, but in us. What does that mean? Don't miss this. It means that the sufferings we face in Christ in this life, are creating in us something that is glorious. It means that our glorification is, more, is about more than one day being in a beautiful and perfect place, but also about God creating us into a beautiful and perfect people. See, heaven, no matter how nice the lodgings will be or how delicious the food, it won't very much feel like paradise if we still were to carry the same anxiety, the same pride, the same lust, the same envy, the same hatred that we do now. But when we share with Christ in his sufferings now, God uses those sufferings to produce in us a glory that will be so much greater than that suffering we face now. He explains this in more detail in the next verse. Look at verse 19. He said, for the creation waits, there's that word, we're waiting, in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. Remember he said in verse 15 that the moment we are justified, we saw this last week, that the moment we're justified, we place our faith in Jesus, we, we, we have been saved from sin's penalty, that we are adopted into the family of God, we become God's children. But just as our inheritance is future, what he's saying in this verse is so our recognition as being God's children is future. The fact is that Christians in this life, we don't much appear like children of God. Just like all other people, we experience suffering, we experience weakness in this life. But Paul says that one day, in the last day, God will publicly reveal our real status as God's children for all to see. 
Jesus prophesied this by these words. He says, many who are first will be last. Many who are last will be first. One of my closest friends, uh, Jonathan, was a counselor with me one summer at a youth camp. And we were both team captains in a uh, five-day, all-week-long competition for camp. Throughout the week, the teams would compete for Uh, points for their teams in sports and skits. I mean, all kinds of activities. And they would just give out points, I mean, for anything. Like, you know, just to get the teams to do what what you want them to do. I mean, you get points for cleaning your your cabin. And you get points for saying the the Bible memory verses for camp and so on. And, And so every day at noon, they held a team rally where they would reveal the point standings. And which teams were on top and which teams were, were in, in last place. And every single day that week, Monday through Friday to the last day of camp at noon, when we had that team rally, my team, come on, y'all, you know it. My team was in first place by a long shot. I mean, we were destroying the competition. My friend's Jonathan team, last place. Every day, not even close. And you, 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 you got to understand, me and my friend Jonathan were very competitive with each other. Like we were looking, we were talking about this team camp knowing we'd be the team leaders, I mean, for like months in advance and like, like you know, putting it on each other like, hey, you know, like, like you're going you're gonna to be destroyed. Like I'm, I'm definitely going to win. We were, we were giving it to each other. And, and, and so now, I mean, you know, after all that bragging, you know, you better believe it. I mean, I was rubbing it in his face every single day at that rally. Each time I would brag about being in first place, Jonathan just kind of stood there with his arms crossed and kind of the smug look on his face. And he just, okay, yeah, yeah, that's, that's all right, that's fine. And just like it, it didn't phase him. Well, the last night of camp came when they announced the winning team. And while just that morning, Jonathan's team was by far in last place and my team was by far in first place it, as it had been all week, they announced that Jonathan's team won the competition. I couldn't believe it. Of course, Jonathan was throwing it in my face now like I definitely deserved. What had happened was that Jonathan realized the first day of camp, his team was definitely not going to win based on athletic ability. So he said, man, i got to figure out another way for us to win. And he realized that all the little camp verses, they, they give you points for memorizing them. And, and nobody really did it. And none of the teams wanted to spend week, their week memorizing the verses. So he decided he was going to get all his teams to memorize all the verses. And he asked the camp director the very first day, he said, hey, don't put these into the point totals until right before the very last Night. I'm still very bitter about this, as you can hear. So while to me and everyone else, it seemed like they were the obvious losers all week long, it was revealed in the end that they were the true victors. See, as Christians, we don't look like the winners right now. It doesn't feel like We're the winners all the time, does it? Most of the time, maybe even. Nevertheless, in the end, in that last day, we will be revealed for who we are. We will be revealed as the true victors, not because of us, because the cross, because the resurrection And we're just tagging along for the ride with Jesus. One day there will be no more suffering. No more pain. No more waiting. But we will receive our full inheritance as God's children. Verse 19 says that all creation waits in eager expectation for this revealing the Greek word there for that, that phrase, eager expectation, it's a big word. It's apokerlodokia. This is made up of uh, kara, which is head, dekomai, which means to stretch, and then the prefix apo, which meaning away from. The picture Paul is giving us here is a head turning around the corner, stretching around the corner to see what's next. They can't wait 
for what's next. They're stretching their head around. If you're a true follower of Jesus, then you know all too well the pain and the suffering of following Jesus right now. The waiting could be tough, but if we are patient, just around the corner is our revealing as God's children. Galatians 6, 9, Paul reminds us, let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. So we must be patient. Number one, for our revealing as God's children. But then we must be patient for number two, for the recreation of our world. For the recreation of our world. Look at verse 20 with me. He says, for the creation was subjected to, what's the next word? Frustration. Not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it. In hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole world, that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to this present time. He's saying that not only do we as Christians specifically suffer for following choosing to follow Jesus, but now Paul says that all creation is awaiting relief from her suffering. He's saying that the world we live in today isn't the way that God created, isn't the way that God intended things to be, but rather our world is full of, as we know, brokenness and corruption. We read in Genesis 3, the very third chapter of the first book of the Bible, that Adam and Eve, the very first humans when they sinned, that the penalty for sin was not only a physical and a spiritual death for humans, but there were also devastating effects for our world itself, as we're reminded of, of an ambulance or fire truck driving by. There's disasters. There's pain. Genesis 3, 17 tells us that God cursed the ground itself so that humans would have to work in painful toil all their days in order to eat and survive. Some of y'all are like, amen, I know what that's like, right? He said to Adam, by the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground. And here we are, millennia later, still feeling that sweat, that exhaustion, from working hard just to get by and to provide for our families. This is what Paul refers to here in verse 20. He says, for the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it. This frustration is a reference to the curse that God placed on earth due to sin, as we just read. He says, though, the choice to sin, of course, was ours. We can't blame God for this. It was us that chose to sin. He says the choice of punishment wasn't something we wanted, but catch this. Paul says this was something that God wanted for us. He says, by, but by the will of the one who subjected it. So you might be thinking, well, why would God want and why would God choose to make life so extraordinarily painful and filled with suffering? Why would God make life frustrating for us? Why would he want that? Well, the reason is found in the next two words. Look at the last two words of this verse. In hope. In hope. In hope of what? Look at verse 21. In hope, verse 21 says... That the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and will be brought into the freedom and glory of the children of 
God. This means that God cursed the ground in hope that we would realize that we aren't in paradise anymore. That we would look and see the brokenness all around us caused by our sin and that we would crave healing from God, the only one who can give us that healing. What this means is that the curse wasn't an act of vindictive punishment that God was just trying to be mean to us and punish us. It means the curse, don't miss this, it means the curse was an act of mercy. You see, God could have just decided to let us be and reap the full consequences of our sin, just allowing us to continue in our ways, thinking everything was fine until one day we die and we're separated from God for eternity. But out of his love for us, God subjected his creation to frustration, to be cursed in hope that we would realize our need for God and seek repentance in faith. And for those who place their faith in Jesus and are saved, notice here it says that the salvation that God provides for us isn't about us leaving the earth and escaping its corruption and brokenness on earth. Instead, he says that God's plan of salvation also includes liberating the earth herself from the curse and brokenness caused by our sin. Look again at verse 21. That the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. Verse 22, we know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to this present time. Now, obviously, I can't speak with personal experience to the pains of childbirth. Um, I was in the room both times my wife gave birth, and I don't think I'll ever read these verses the same again after that first experience. And I can just only imagine how my wife and all you moms even better understand the meaning of this verse. Paul gives us a poignant picture of how humanity and the very earth, the very creation itself, longs to be free from its painful suffering and brokenness from sin and the curse. But he says that while both human and non-human creation alike has been warped and, and broken by sin and the curse, that God's plan of salvation includes fixing all that is broken. The phrase in verse 21 of creation being set free suggests that the ultimate destiny of creation is not annihilation, but transformation. This means that salvation isn't about God rescuing us from the earth, but rather God recreating the earth as a part of his eternal kingdom. It means that the new heaven and the new earth foretold in the book of Revelation doesn't mean a destroyed heaven and earth, but a restored heaven and earth. That the future fire which will one day wipe clean the face of the earth is not, uh, uh, is not one of desolation, but a fire of purification. And what this means for us today is that our world as we know it will not always be as it is now. That all the corruption in our government, the social injustice, the economic inequality, the, all the broken relationships we experience, all the pain and suffering we face due to sin and the curse on earth right now will be cleansed from this earth. And I think this is so important for us as Christians to grasp because I meet so many Christians who were just like, man, I'm just, just ready. Jesus, take me away from here. But I don't think that should be our attitude towards this world. No, salvation isn't God taking us away and, and wiping off the face of the earth and destroying it. Salvation is God using us 
to create in us something glorious and to do the same on this earth. We will one day live in the full reign and splendor splendor of the kingdom of God and the new heaven and new earth for all eternity. But this means right now it's going to be frustrating. My one of my one of my uh, sister in laws her her two year old said the other day she was frustrated at something and she looked at her mom and said I'm going to quit my job. Which means, of course, she's definitely heard that phrase a lot at the, around the house. <laughs> Life is frustrating. But it won't always be that way. We must be patient for the recreation of our world. And then finally, we must be patient for the redemption of our bodies. Look at verse, chapter 8, verse 23. He says, not only so, speaking of creation's liberation, he says, not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. So while all creation is groaning in pain, we're awaiting its recreation. He says, even more so, Christians inwardly yearn for their adoption to God's family to be completed. Remember in verse 15, we just said a moment ago that Christians have already been adopted in God's family, but here it says we're still awaiting for that adoption. Well, again, this goes back to what we talked about last week. Uh, What we learned about how salvation unfolds in three unique phases, what we call justification, What we call then sanctification, the process that we are currently being saved from the power of sin. And then our future glorification, being saved from sin's very presence. So verse 23 is saying that at justification we receive the first fruits of the Spirit. We might say today the first installment of the payment, the down payment, the, the pledge That is, the Holy Spirit guarantees our future glorification. But then he describes our glorification further by using the phrase, the redemption of our bodies. Redemption. To redeem something. This was used back in this time as as we don't use this phrase so much in this way anymore, but it meant to buy back something in order to set it free in order to rescue it from the bonds of slavery. Thus, the redemption of our bodies refers to the day when God will take our mortal bodies and will set them free from sin and its effects from the curse and will transform these mortal bodies into our glorified bodies, as we talked about last week. The day we will finally be set free from all the weakness and frailty of our flesh. He explains further in verse 24. He says, For in this hope we were saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Like, Pastor Matt, like I I hear what you're saying, but like, like, where's the proof? That's why it's called hope. It's future. We don't see it yet. Who hopes for what they already have? He says in verse 24. But if we hope for what we do not have yet, there it is, we wait for it patiently. He says in verse 26, in the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit Because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. So just as the earth is eagerly awaiting her redemption, we too are eagerly awaiting ours. But he says we must patiently wait for it. 
Paul describes our state right now, the human condition here in verse 26 as one of weakness. Again, we talked about last week when we are saved, when, when we are justified, we are saved positionally. But while we are still being sanctified, we are still in a fight against our flesh, against the world, and against the devil until the day we are glorified. However, he says, while we wait, he says, we're not in this fight alone. You say, how do I know? Where's the proof? Well, he says, you've been given. You're not in this fight alone. You've been given the Holy Spirit. If you're justified, yeah, we have to wait for our inheritance, but right now we have the Holy Spirit to aid us and to help us in our weakness while we wait. That means that when we don't even know what to pray sometimes, that's okay. Because the Holy Spirit makes intercession to the Father on our behalf right now. When we don't know how to respond sometimes to loss or to tragedy in our lives, the Spirit is here to be our comforter, to give us peace that passes all understanding. You say, I'm not strong enough for some of the things I'm going through, Pastor Matt. You don't understand. I, I can't do it on my own. And I'm saying, Paul is saying, you don't have to do it on your own. The Holy Spirit is here to help us while we wait. When we're overwhelmed by sin or temptation, our, our bodies, our minds, we're just so worn down that we just don't know if we can keep going anymore and make it to the finish line. The Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. He's saying that we need to be patient during this process of sanctification while God is still working in us, forming us, chiseling us into his image. So that means don't get discouraged that you still aren't perfect. That you sometimes don't know how or what to pray, or, or sometimes you just don't feel like praying. Because the process isn't complete yet. Not until our glorification will we finally have the full victory over our flesh and the world and the devil. Popular singer and songwriter, a Christian singer and songwriter named Mandisa came out with a song in 2013 that became a big hit. This was early in her career. And the, 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 some of the lyrics of the chorus go like this. Whatever it is you may be going through, I know he's not going to let it get the best of you. You're an overcomer. The song is named Overcomer. He, she says, stay in the fight until the final round. You're not going under. Because God is holding you right now. You might be down for a moment, feeling like it's hopeless. That's when he reminds you, you're an overcomer. Four years later, she came out with another song. She'd gone through a little more life, had a little more experience. She said this. She said, not scared to say it. I used to be the one preaching it to you that you could overcome. She said, I still believe it, but it ain't easy. Because the world I painted where things just all work out, it started changing. And I started having doubts. She wrote, and it got me so down. But I picked myself back up. And I started telling me, no, my God's not done. Making me a masterpiece. He's still working on me. The chorus says he started something good and I'm gonna believe it. He started something good and he's gonna complete it. So I'll celebrate the truth. His work in me ain't through. I'm just unfinished. You might be here this morning and you're not sure if you've ever been saved, if you've ever been justified. Look, if you're having doubts about your salvation, if you're not 100% sure, 
if heaven is your home, then I want to invite you to come talk to me. Come find me after the service, and I want to connect with you so you can know that heaven is your home. Or maybe you're here this morning, and like me, you can relate to this song. You can relate to Mandisa's story. You're a Christian, and maybe at, and man, at one point in your life, you just felt like an overcomer. But lately, it just feels like this life has just beaten you down, and you don't know how much longer you can keep going for Christ. Can I remind you this morning that it's okay that you feel this way right now? Because number one, God is still not finished with you yet. And that number two, that even just a small sliver of the glory in the next life, it can't even be compared. It can't even be compared with all the sufferings of this life put together. Again, I can't relate from personal experience, but as painful and as agonizing as the, child, the process of childbirth is every mom I've ever talked to has told me, they said in that moment, when you're finally getting to hold your baby, they said all the painful nine months, they said, it's all worth it, it's, it's not even close. None of us particularly enjoy waiting we all feel the pain of following Jesus in this life. But the wait will be worth it in the end. You just got to be patient. Would you pray with me? Lord, we groan for our redemption. Give us patience. We ask this in faith. Would your Holy Spirit help us in this time? Help us to remember we're not alone in this fight. Give us endurance, Lord. And Lord, I beg you, if anyone is in this room, Lord, that is not a Christian, Lord, that doesn't have that hope as we have, God, would you not let them leave this room today without, without getting saved? We pray this in faith in your name of Jesus.